Good evening. St. Malachi. It's been there 170 years now, this year. Uh, I think to talk about St. Malachi, we ought to talk about the Catholic religion in the colonies and in the United States once it was the United States. The Catholics weren't uh, particularly welcomed anywhere. The uh, Williams Penn's grand experiment with the free of religion, freedom of religion worked pretty good. Catholics were allowed to have mass if nobody knew about it. So that wasn't really proper. But in Maryland, Lord Baltimore was given the charter for the colony. In 1634, he started the St. Mary's town, which became the capital of Maryland at the time. This is way down the southern part of Maryland. It was neither Catholic nor Protestant. Most of the investors were Catholic. Most of the workers were Protestant. So they didn't denote one over the other, and things worked great for about 50 years. 1689, uh, Lord Baltimore apparently died, and the Catholics were rebelled against by the Protestants. And in 1704, all Catholic schools and churches were closed in Maryland. Uh, 1704, they say, but 1704 also at Warwick, they started the St. Francis Xavier Church which is really a plantation. They had over 1,700 acres there at one time, slaves and the whole nine yards. But uh, they were allowed to continue, whether it was on the eastern shore and far enough from Annapolis and Baltimore to, that it didn't matter or what, I don't know. But in 1745, they started an academy there. And Charles Calvert, who became the first bishop in the United States, and his cousin John Calvert were both students there. John was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. From there, they went onto the road, spread the word, so to speak, traveled as far as Philadelphia. One of their main stops became Ivy Mills, and I think it was by accident one time they stopped there, and they were looking for a priest and they ended up with saying mass at the Wilcox's home for years and years. I mean, literally years and years. 1720s they started. And apparently, later on, one of the Wilcoxes married a non-Catholic. And she would uh, sort of make a little rattle of the pots and pans when they were having mass to show her dissatisfaction, but it went on anyway. But if, from the 1720s, it wasn't until 1856 that they built a church at Ivy Mills, St. Thomas the Apostle. It is still there and is used for special occasions, but I've built a new church since to accommodate the increase in the population. From there on into Philadelphia, they started the first church there, or built the first church there in 1733, St. Joe's. And at the time, it was the only public meeting place for Catholics in all the colonies. In Maryland, there were a couple of chapels, or several, I don't know how many, but they were all private, and uh, so that was the only public place. There was still distension in Philadelphia in the middle 1840s. The uh, Know Nothing, it was a political party, I think, sort of a, got in a Catholic feeling, stirred up again, and they burned churches and homes and so forth. And the cathedral, when it was built, was actually built with the windows pretty high, so as to prevent breakage, at least to a degree. Priests from St. Joe's are known to have come out to Malachi and uh, other areas of the par or Pennsylvania, and Jersey, and Delaware, of course. The other church that got started in 1772 was Coffee Run, down in Route 48, going into Wilmington. It was St. Mary's, started by the priest from Old Bohemia or St. Francis, whichever you want to call it. It became known as the Bohemian Manor or old, just plain Old Bohemia, which incidentally is still there, and in summertime they do have masses there occasionally. But Coffee Run became the chief one for Delaware, and Delaware apparently never had any religious problems. The Swedes who started it were very open about it. And, Everybody seemed to get along. 
But it was the ones from Coffee Run who came to Malachi mainly. But this was in 1772 when it was started, so there was a time there long before that that uh, if there were a priest, they must have come from Bohemia, which is probably, or very likely. The first real date we have for Malachi is 1771, August, a picture of a tombstone here, Thomas McGuire, 15 years old, apparently died of tuberculosis from what the, we know. And he was buried on a knoll on his father's farm. And this knoll became the spot for the church and the cemetery eventually. But he is the only one that uh, precedes 1800 in the graveyard. In 1794, they made an effort to build a church, gathered up logs and stones with the intention of being built, but uh, whether the lack of fervor or the unsettled times or the lack of priest, which is very possible, they just got nothing done. In 1757, there were only 117 Catholics in all Chester County, and whether well, Chester County was ours, we know Chester County or bigger, I don't know, but it's still not many people. So it's easy to see why a church didn't get started. But the lapse of years there go on, and there were still masses, and they would be staying in homes or in the barns or wherever they could get the people to meet. And the priests would stay with the families, the McGuire's or the Ferrens or whoever else. There's one note here that talks about a priest staying with a J. Durat in Londonderry Township between 1810 and 1818. Uh, the interesting thing about that, J. Durat or John Durat owned our place in 1836 and 37. He had a public auction there in 37. And after that, he owned a blacksmith shop, and it was auctioned not long later. So whether he was a, I don't know, opportunist or what, but or they moved around, I don't know. But uh, the names were interesting. 18, Mass was certainly said between 1794 and 1838 when they did get around to building the church. How many, how regular, it's interesting. No, no one seems to know. But in 1838, they got together and did build it. John Farron was a carpenter in charge. And the Farrens, of course, have been around forever. And you say you're related? Mm -hmm. So they're still here. <laughs> oh, uh, John, apparently whiskey was a problem on the job. Instead of having a glass of water, he had a glass of whiskey when they needed a drink. But uh, he didn't want any of that, so he supposedly made a mandate that if there's whiskey, there's no job. So the whiskey stayed away, apparently, because they got the church built. And on January 1st, 1839, they did have Mass there to celebrate the dedication and so forth. And the Father Miller was coming from Philadelphia by train, getting off in Coatesville. Well, Coatesville had two railroad stations, one in town and one called Midway at the West End. So somebody went to pick him up and went to the West End, and no priest, so went home again. Well, then Father Miller got a ride to town, or to Malachi, Harley Town, and met who he was supposed to meet. Well, they didn't think he was a priest. They thought he was some kind of a thief or something. <laughs> they weren't going to have him. So they loaded him up with another guy to watch him, took him to another man to verify him. Well, they decided he was Father Miller. So the next day they had Mass, and apparently the church had no seats, no plaster on the walls, just a bare stone, and apparently he collected two hundred dollars and fifty cents in the collection. Someone took him back to Wilmington that night, or during the day, whatever. He bought two candlesticks with a two fifty cruciform, glass cruciform candlesticks, which are still at the church, which is pretty amazing. From then on, how regular mass was, I don't know. I don't know whether anybody knows. I imagine it was pretty sporadic because they're still dependent on Priests were assigned, but the priests were few and far between. So whatever they did have, they had when they could. Uh, it's interesting, they talk about 1852, I guess, the 
built a church in Parksburg, uh, Church of Seven Dollars, up on Strasburg Road. But at that time, they made that the main parish and made Malachi a mission. And that went on a little bit. And then the next thing you know, well, Coatesville was a mission also. Next thing, Coatesville was the main church in Parksburg, and Malachi were missions, and then they turned around again. And then in 71, till 1902, I guess, 03, they were both missions to Coatesville again. Uh, population apparently was very small. I think in the early 1900s, there were like 32 families among both churches, so hardly made it worthwhile sometimes. In 19, well, in 1860, they enlarged the church, which is interesting. If they had uh, such small attendance, why they need to enlarge it? And uh, there's no record that I have seen that how big the church was to begin with or anything else. So we don't know what they enlarged it from, and how much is enlargement, and so forth. There's no evidence in the walls or anything where anything was changed. Apparently, it's pretty much the same now as it was at that time, once it was redone. And uh, during those years, a uh, bishop would come from Philadelphia to give the confirmation sacrament. There were a number of bishops over the years, but one was John Neumann. He's actually from Czechoslovakia and came to Bohemia and from there to Philadelphia. I think he was the fourth bishop of the city. And he did attend the Mass and performed the sacrament there at Malachi in 1852. And he was sort of a favorite of Father Snyder's. So my mother donated a statue of him, which is in the cemetery. She donated in honor of a memory of her father, husband and two sons who had died before. Uh, in 1864, 1864, no. 1904, I guess it was the priest from Parksburg, not from Parksburg, from Coatesville did a major refurbishing of the church. And that's kind of interesting again, because by then it wasn't a mission to the, that. And I don't think Coatesville was even a parish yet then, but uh, he did it anyway. And then again in 1837, Father Carr, who was the pastor of both churches, did a major renovation, probably rehab more like it, on the church. And it's interesting, he had help from Stanley Reeves, he, I guess he was an artist, uh, Plunkett Stewart and Mark Sullivan, as well as a lot of other locals, I'm sure. And in 1838, they did celebrate their 100th anniversary. Uh, 18... Well, between 18, 1937 and 1952, again, Mass was very sporadic. Depending on weather, depending on priests, and depending on everything else, I guess. But in 52, when Father Walsh was there, the, the diocese made a mandate that Mass would have to be held three or four times a year or they would close it. So that made a little more regularity. And then Father McGartland came in 64. He instituted the Mass once a month which was better. In 1974, Father Snyder came. He was in favor of having Mass there all the time, which he started and has continued. Father Snyder also put in central heat and electricity. I was there a time or two in the 50s, and there were a couple pot belly stoves there at that time. And there's the story of a rattlesnake being in church. Now, I don't know whether anything to that or not, but we have seen garter snakes and the occasional mouse. And occasional dog would walk in when the door was open and walk around, walk out again. But then, 
1993, Father Victor Eschbach came. Now, Father came from a all-black parish in North Philadelphia with a lot of hallelujah and a whole nine yards. And I don't think he was quite sure whether he was sent to Siberia, the church, or just what. But uh, he has made, uh, taken over quite well. And we even got to like him. <laughs> but he installed plumbing, dug a well. We actually have a restroom now, which is nice. You can always make out without, but it's much nicer with. And then he had the audacity to talk about air conditioning. Well, I said it could be put in a couple of days, but we all shuddered at that to ruin the church, you know. But it was installed, and of course we all love it now in the nice human days. Also in the late 90s, Father John Van de Par retired to Parksburg. He had a parish in South Philadelphia, been there for like 40 years. He was a mission priest. And it was either that or go to the old folks' home, and he went, didn't think he was ready for that at 75. So Father Eschbach asked him to come here and help him and so forth. Well, he took on renovating the church himself, and the amount of work that man did is unbelievable. He took windows out and redid them completely. There's indoor shutters, and he took them off and redid them completely. He did the pews, did the floor, just on and on. And then we have an old Quaker, Ted Wilson, who brings his wife to church every Sunday, he has for years and years, but he's still a Quaker and not about to change, which is fine. But he and Father John worked together and they built new doors for the church out of solid oak, which Ted had. And of course, to watch those two work was interesting because Ted thought Father John didn't know anything and Father John didn't think Ted knew anything. And they're about, well, not the same age either. Ted's a little older. But they're up there. But they got along and did the job. Uh, there's a few important dates in our family there. Uh, son and daughter-in-law married there in 75, and another grandson and daughter-in-law married in 2004. When mother's funeral mass was from there, she wasn't buried there, but the mass was there. And in 2004, they had Tug McGraw's funeral there. That uh, was quite an affair and quite private and quite unannounced. How they got that thing pulled off without all the press in the world being there, I don't know, but they did. It was by invitation only, but they put up tents in the whole nine yards and did the thing. Tug and Father had become friends in Philadelphia when he was there. How and why, I forget now, but uh, he used to talk about going around soliciting money like all pastors do, whether they're Catholic or Protestant or whatever. And he said if he had Tug with him, he never had a problem. <laughs> so it worked out good. And Tug died of a brain tumor eventually, but uh, when he was sick in the hospital and uh, was down south somewhere, Father went down and was with him a bit. And he came back and did fine for a while, and then it got him, but they had the funeral there. They, uh, we had 150th anniversary back a while, and, uh, and then we had 165th, which is an oddball year, but the main church had 150th that year, so we just made a double thing and had 165th out here, which was real nice. The grounds, as far as taking care of them, for 60 years, the Shank family were the caretakers of church and grounds. And uh, they're to be commended because, of course, they lived down the road from where she is now. And uh, it's just to be commended for what they did. And there's also a special thank you to Mrs. Wister, who donated two acres. So we have a nice size cemetery now, which was getting a little crowded where they were. I uh, don't have a whole lot more. Any questions or anything? Warwick. Warwick. Uh, go down to Elton, on down, 213, I guess it is, down in there, along near the Bohemia River. Uh, you see a sign out along that road, and it's back there a couple of miles. 
As I say, the church is being rehabbed. It's really a very pretty little church. We were there a couple of years ago. But it's very influential in the church in this area. The priests that preach there now, they come from Coast Hill? No, Parksburg. Parksburg, okay. It's the main parish. And you do have church every Sunday now, right? Have which? Every Sunday? Yes, 1030. And what kind of attendance do you have? 130, 140. Is that right? Pretty much average. Some days down, some days up. Huh? That's about four. It's a nice crowd. 200's good. If we have had a size 300, then that's really stretching things. When Christmas, when all the goodies that don't come regular come. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they do have a very pretty Christmas service there at 8, 8.30, I guess it is, Christmas Eve. Do you know when you got the organ in the church? Or it's still there. And I played it for years and years, and I was telling somebody she even played it when she was getting a little losing it, and she wasn't quite playing the same thing sometimes they were singing, but <laughs> she was dedicated. And of course, no one can play it now. So they have a keyboard, which works fine, but it's not the same. Um, what about the Stations of the Cross, the, the pictures along there? How old are they? I don't think anybody knows uh, from what I've seen and heard, and I've always talked about sending them away and getting them rehabbed and such, but it's never been done. I don't know whether it should be or shouldn't be, whether they're too fragile or probably, possibly just as well leave them be. Whether they've been there since, I don't know when. It's, uh, they have records, theoretically, of weddings and so forth, but uh, apparently they were very haphazard in the early years. Uh, they would put one thing down, a burst or something, and then they'd stick a wedding in. It might be the same year, it might not, or they might not put a year in. So we really don't have a lot to go on that. And how many people were there and such. Apparently a lot of uh, baptisms and such were let go to people who were adults because of the lack of priests. And uh, they might come up. This month, it might come next month, it might not be, it might be several months, it might be years. And if it didn't seem to be there, then you missed them, then you wait again. And uh, there is records of people going to Coffee Run when they need the priest seriously. But that had to be a bit of a hassle to, from Malachi. To, and of course the parish at that time, in 1838 when it was made a parish, extended from Westchester and Fraser clear of the Susquehanna River. So nobody was going to cover the whole territory on a regular basis. There was no one, no way. And of course, there's been 20 plus parishes made out of that same area now. What can you tell us about the um, children's cemetery? The which? Isn't there a children's cemetery there? Yes. Uh, I don't know how or why that got started. And I'm still not sure why. It is, yes. Uh, four, five, six maybe now. Uh, I don't know. It is there, yes. Is that recent or how old are the stones? How old are the headstones or is that something recent? Oh, that's recent, very that's recent. recent. Yeah. Uh, well, I say 20, 25 years maybe. I'm trying to think. One kid's uh, just graduated from high school this year. Her, her sister, I guess, is one of the first ones. So 20, around 20 years probably, give or take. But... Uh, is Father Schneider buried there? No, in Downingtown. So he is from Downingtown? From Downingtown, yes. Does your church cover, it covers a certain radius, or...? <laughs> I, it uh, theoretically probably does. But we have people that drive 30 miles there just because they want to go there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have ones from Oxford, West Grove, even down to Thornton, down Delaware County. There's a couple that come out pretty regular. So uh, it's an amalgamate of parishes. It talks here about uh, one of these papers about people walking from West Grove to there way back when. Now that's dedication to me. I'm uh, 
pleased to live in the house down the hill from St. Malachi, yes. as you know. The only complaint I have is that for the most recent anniversary, they straightened the cross, which I always enjoyed the fact that every time they straightened it up, it tipped over, but this time they really got it straight. But well, you know why? The Quaker Ted Wilson built it, and it had to be right. <laughs> it is, and I'm here to testify that it's staying straight. But when my house went into the National Registry, it's now known as the Farron House. Okay. And Mr. Shank, that, whom you mentioned, who was the caretaker, actually grew up in that house. His family owned it along with the big property down in the hollow. Oh, I didn't know that. South of the church. Okay. And when... Um, the Shanks died, and Mr. Shank, and who was who became the caretaker after his father, when he and his brother sort of wanted to get the estate settled, the brother already had a gas station in Newtown Square, and Mr. Shank wanted the big piece of land so that his kids could have houses there. In fact, two of them do, and so they sold off my the piece of property that I was lucky enough to get. And uh, the brother of the gas station got the money from that property, and Mr. Shank got the valley that now the Smiths okay. have their farm on. But the house that I live in is known as the Farron House, and it, it marks the fact that the gentleman who lived there was the Farron that you refer to as having built the current church. And was that Mrs. Shank a Farron? Mr. Shank was not uh, Mrs., a Mrs., I mean. Pardon? Mrs. Shank. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't either. Um, Whether there's any connection. I honestly don't know. I, the, the property that I live on stayed the same from 1726. And um, it's never changed its shape. And a number of people owned it, in fact, including somebody who figured out how to grow mushrooms year-round. <laughs> and that's why my house is tilted, because there's a, there was, when I bought it, a empty, thank goodness, 500 gallon water tank on the in the attic that he pumped water up to and ran downhill to a building that was on Mrs. Wister's, you know, on my on the north edge of my property, um, and he grew mushrooms there. But in fact, the house is named for the the man who architected and built okay. the church. So it's all it's all I, I I love watching the people come to church on Sundays, and I go to um, Christmas Eve. Is it also true that your house had electric from the line direct? It, it is true that my the electric company did not know my house existed. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I can say, <laughs> I wouldn't want the shank to get a bed. No, 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 no. I bought the house that needed windows, doors, plumbing, etc. And I called the electric company. It had electricity to tell them that I wanted to open an account and they assured me that there was no house there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's bad news for me because I just bought it. <laughs> and when they arrived, um, the Shanks were very ingenious people. No one died and there was electricity in the house. That's as far as I can go. <laughs> Privately, I might describe how that electricity got there and the fact that that house is still there is nothing short of a miracle. Prob well, once I got the, from the church on the hill, One of the boys took care of it. the electric company. Yes. And was very clever, apparently, with not being electrocuted. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the house had electricity, but... Um, the electric company did not. They, no plumb. The electric company... Oh, no, they were beside themselves with me. <laughs> thought I was... Uh, Elmer, did you ever hear um, anything about the all-girls Catholic school that Mr. Farron... I assume it's probably the same Mr. Farron had. It was over here, um, I believe it, close to Fernwood Road in that area. Never. And, uh, at that time, they, the Catholics and the Protestants didn't mix, and so he built this girls' school. And, and there were two sisters, I believe, that were teachers there. But I, George? I think know? that's what was the Grange that they moved down okay. where it is now. It was across from the big house at Fernwood. Never heard that. It was Fernwood Academy. Hmm. I have some pictures here and some newspaper clippings.
There's a poem here if anybody wants to hear it. You up to that? <laughs> That's uh, supposedly by Jan, John Beard, who is called, uh, I won't say who he's called because that's on another piece of paper, so we won't go into that. It's called The Little Church on the Hill, 1965. There's a wandering road through valleys green that leads to a sacred shrine where all is peaceful and serene neath a tall and stately pine whose towering branches seem to guard the final resting place of those who labored long and hard, aided only by God's grace to build this humble little church of native stone and wood where they might enjoy the freedom of a Christian brotherhood. Man with a spirit that never knew the meaning of doubt or fear, who saw a cherished dream come true that we might worship here. Far removed from noise and crowds, this age-old landmark stands. A monument to those who toiled with strong and eager hands. Then viewed with pride, a task well done with a feeling that all was well. In the firm belief that God the Son within these walls would dwell. Yes, in every graceful line one sees the pioneer spirit showing. Where the flaming torch of liberty shall forever keep on glowing. No stained glasses windows will you find to adorn this holy shrine. And the shades of red and blue and gold reflect the bright sunshine. The walls of the delicate shade of green bear the time-worn floor, where echoes still the measured tread of those who have gone before. Upon the roof erect, there stands a cross of all salvation, reminding those with hands bowed low in prayer and meditation that this is, in truth, a hallowed place where men are ever free, to pray, pray that God's abiding grace be theirs eternally. Speaking of roof, when Father Eschbach came, the roof was sagging a wee bit. So somebody did a little investigating and it was only sagging because about half of the rafters were broken and it was about to come on in. So they did fix that first off. But uh, that was, I think the interesting thing about the inside of this church, it looks more like a New England Protestant church than it was a Catholic church. It has the little doors on the pews. This is, I don't know when it was taken, a number of years ago, but uh, it shows Anna Edwards and Father Snyder. But it's very plain, it has hard wooden kneelers, which everybody complains about. I'm sure someday they'll get padded. There's a lovely statue of the Blessed Mother there now in lieu of these statues. It was donated by Daniel's family, I guess. A girl was killed here in a freak accident. She's from Ireland. And her sister is actually married to a fellow now and lives in the parish and attends regular with her three little boys. And this is the tombstone of Thomas McGuire. He was taken away lest wickedness should alter his understanding or deceit beguile his soul. Now that's pretty nice words. 